Good morning. It's good to see everyone here this morning. I appreciate Richard for leading that song. Its timing was perfect. Couldn't ask for a better spot to, to sing that song in conjunction with the message of this morning. Let me add my welcome to those of you that are visiting with us, much as Aaron said earlier when he opened the service. We're so glad you're here. We hope you will benefit from being here with us today. As you know, uh, our minister resigned three weeks ago, and for the last three weeks, the elders have been bringing the message on Sunday morning. Well, I'm the third and the last, and probably not necessarily saving the best for last, but uh, hopefully this morning what I have to say will, will prick your heart and give you something to think about and will be an encouragement to you. One of my favorite memories in growing up as a young child was spending time with my grandmother. My earliest recollection of my grandmother was that we lived in a house on one street and she lived in a house that was sort of perpendicular around on the next street. And I, I liked to spend time with grandma because she was fun to be with. Later on, when I, when I was about in the fourth grade, we moved into another house. And my grandmother and my aunt, uh, they lived together. My aunt never married my dad's sister. And there was just a house in between our house and their house. And so I was able to spend a lot of time up there. A lot of times, Grandma didn't even know I was in the house. I'd just sneak in. But one of, one of the favorite memories of mine, and trust me, I'm not a poet, nor am I a big fan of poetry. My grandmother would quote poetry. And it just always fascinated me how she was able to remember so much poetry, and she would just rattle those off. And you know, there are some things that you remember your parents telling you when you're a child. There's some things you remember about your grandparents when you're a child, and that's one of those things that I remember is, is grandma quoting poetry. Many of us have heard of the poet Robert Burns, the Scottish poet Robert Burns. And he wrote the poem, To a Mouse. And probably the line that is most quoted and that we remember is this. But mouse, you are not alone. Improving foresight may be vain. The best laid schemes of mice and men go off in a skew. That leaves us nothing but grief and pain for promised joy. How many times have we heard that line of mice and men? The story behind this is supposedly that uh, Mr. Burns went out to the woodpile during the winter to get some logs to throw in the fireplace. And he picked up those logs, and unbeknownst to him, a mouse had made his nest in those logs, and he disturbed that nest, and the mouse went scurrying off. And so he sat down and wrote this poem. Now, I don't know about you, I'm not too worried about the plight of a mouse, as long as he doesn't come into my house and I have to chase him. So, uh, but there is something to be gained from looking at this that the best laid plans of men go askew. The idea I want us to get out, get out of this is that we can plan something. We can plan something well. We can take all kinds of precautions. and We can do what needs to be done only to have it all overturned and ruined. And that does bother me. We all make plans and we all want to see them come to fruition, but they don't always happen that way. Sometimes you and I struggle with the teachings of the Bible. Sometimes we have a hard time following them. 
We're all human, and we're all prone to mistakes. Don't get me wrong. I know what the Bible says, just like you do. I know what it says, and I understand that, and I agree with him. And God doesn't need my approval for this, or he doesn't need your approval. But we still struggle at times following the scriptures and obeying the scriptures because we are human. The book of James is a practical book. I think we all that have been in the church for any amount of time realize that about the book of James. The book of James challenges Christians to step up their faith and to live it out to its fullest. The fourth chapter of James deals with a presumptuous disregard for God and his ways. And in particular, our passage that was read just a few minutes ago by Jimmy, if you would, get your Bibles and turn over to James 4. And I want to read the passage again. James 4, verses 13 through 16. Come now, you who say, today or tomorrow we will go to such and such a city. Spend a year there, buy and sell, and make a profit. Whereas you do not know what will happen tomorrow, for what is your life? It is even a vapor that appears for a little time and then vanishes away. Instead, you ought to say, if the Lord wills, we shall live and do this or that. But now you boast in your arrogance. All such boasting is evil. Ask yourself the question, what is it that I can take away from this bit of scripture and how can I apply it to our lives? What's the point of this passage? What's the instruction? What's the correction? Or what is the training for us? And is there more that we can understand by reading other scriptures? First of all, let me say that making plans is not bad in and of itself. This particular passage in James uses a business venture as an illustration to tell us about the best laid plans and how they go complete, fall completely apart. Uh, James is not telling us that making plans is bad. God makes plans. Peter tells us that before the creation of the world that God had planned for Jesus to come as a sacrifice for the sin of mankind. Mankind had not yet been created, but God had already made plans. In the Old Testament, God told the Israelites that he had plans for them. Not to harm them, but to bring them good. Making plans is not a sin. But sin is the conclusion of this particular passage. So what is the teaching? You notice in verse 14, it talks about life is, is like a vapor. It vanishes. I don't know about you, but on our way to church this morning, we were coming down 346, and I noticed down in a, a little gully, there was a little bit of mist. And I couldn't help but think about, about this passage. Now, I'm sure by now, because it's warmed up some, that that, that, that vapor or that mist is not there anymore. But our lives are like a vapor. And the older we get, the more we realize that. How many of us that are older can remember back when we were young, as teenagers or even younger, feeling how invincible we are, were at that time? We didn't think anything could harm us. We thought, you know, we'll live to be a, to a ripe old age. Well, that's not always the case, is it? 
we, uh, you know, I, I, I'm thinking back in, in my life. That's the example that I'm going to use. In 10 days, Gail and I will celebrate our 49th wedding anniversary. Now, that's a lot of years. We have been fortunate enough to have three wonderful children. We've got six grandkids and one great-grandchild. And sometimes that just seems like that happened yesterday. And then there are other times I look back and it seems like that was a long time ago. But in my mind, when I look back at that time, or I, even now, today, when I look at my wife, I picture her as she was when we got married. And y'all may laugh at this when I say this, but I think of myself as being young and skinny and, and actually having hair. But you know, time has marched on and God has been good to us. Uh, we're not rich in terms of the way we think of rich, but God has always supplied our needs. Uh, I know both of us feel very fortunate that we have been able to spend all this time together. And we feel fortunate that God has always provided for us and seen that we have our basic needs. And I think that's what uh, one of the things that is going on here. If you notice in verse, uh, in this passage here, that these people are, are sinning because when they, they're looking at the future as though they are in, in control of the future, not God. Uh, how many of us are like that? How many of us make plans and don't have God involved in them? When we do this, we're minimizing the sovereignty of God and we're setting ourselves up as putting ourselves equal to God. And we all know that that's not right. None of us are even close to being equal to God. But sometimes, and in this, in this case, in this passage, people show their arrogance, their pride, and their conceit. And when we think ourselves equal to God and we don't put God in our plans that's what gets us into trouble it's making plans without God being involved that gets us in trouble these people in this passage these men did not seek God or include God but they excluded God ask yourself the question are we that way today do we know people that are that way but the most important question you can ask is, am I that way? If you would, turn over to Luke, the 12th chapter. In verse 16, Jesus tells a parable. And I know this has been used a lot, but I think it it bodes well for what we're talking about this morning. Luke chapter 12, verse 16. Then he spoke a parable to them, saying, The ground of a certain rich man yielded plentifully. And he thought within himself, saying, What shall I do, since I have no room to store my crops? So he said, I will do this. I will pull down my barns, and I will build greater. And there I will store all my crops and my goods. And I will say to my soul, Soul, you have many goods laid up for many years. Take your ease. Eat, drink, and be merry. But God said to him, Fool, this night your soul will be required of you. Then those will those things be be which you have provided. So is he who lays up treasure for himself 
and is not rich towards God. Again, in this parable, Jesus is warning about the desire to store up things for ourselves instead of being rich or generous towards God. Jesus is telling us about a man who has an abundance of crops. The man thought about and wondered about what to do. He made plans. And of course his solution was to tear down the barns and build bigger ones so he could store his belongings. Again, there's nothing wrong with that. The problem was the man's desire was for things, not knowing he would die that very night. God wasn't a part of his plans. How many of us are that way? We don't think about dying. We don't think about that that could happen to us. We're invulnerable. The point of this is that when God is not a part of the plan, the best laid plans are the wrong plans. Again, planning is not bad, but don't leave God out of those plans. When you decide where you want to live, is God a part of those plans? Or are we more concerned about where, we're, where we work, how we're going to commute to work? Or are we thinking about how we can bring glory to God and build our spiritual life and enhance our families with the influence of Christian friends? Young people, let me ask you a question. What about your school? What about your prospective jobs? What about your future spouse? Are you looking for a, a Christian to share your life with? If you're not, let me encourage you to do that. There's nothing better than a Christian mate. I know people ask how Gail and I met. I know my wife is tired of me telling this story, but it's one of my favorite stories. Somebody asked us one time how we met, and I said, in the church nursery. And there was a woman that was there, and she said, what were you doing in the church nursery? And I looked at her, and I said, I was laying in a crib. So, you know, Gail and I have known each other all our lives. We really couldn't stand each other until I guess we got in junior high. We didn't pay much attention to each other. But we started dating, and like most teenagers, it was off and on, off and on. But we did get married, and to, to use a term, we lived happily ever after. And uh, see, I can make her smile occasionally. But uh, let me encourage you young people. I mean, that's one of the things I'm so proud of, of Justin and Kenzie is I think that's what they are doing. They're making plans, but they have God in those plans in their lives. And would that we all would do that. Again, let me ask you the question. Is God included in your plans? Make your plans. Just make them thinking about God and His will more than your own will. If you would now, turn over to Matthew 26. And in verse 26, uh, 36, rather. This takes place in between, in between the time that Peter denied Christ and between... Judas betraying our Lord. Jesus came with them to a place called Gethsemane and said to the disciples, Sit here while I go and pray over there. And he took them with him, Peter and the two sons of Zebedee, and he began to be sorrowful and deeply distressed. 
Then he said to them, My soul is exceedingly sorrowful, even to death. Stay here and watch with me. He went a little further and fell on his face and prayed, saying, O my Father, if it is possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not as I will, but as you will. Then he came to the disciples and found them sleeping and said to Peter, What? Could you not watch with me one hour? Watch and pray, lest you enter into temptation. The spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak. Again a second time he went away and prayed, saying, O my Father, if this cup cannot pass away from me, unless I drink it, your will be done. And he came and found them asleep again, for their eyes were heavy. So he left them, went away again, and prayed the third time, saying the same words. Of course, we all know that at this time, Jesus is in the Garden of Gethsemane. He's praying there. And as we can tell from these scriptures, there are certain emotions that Jesus was feeling at this time. He was feeling anguish. He was feeling sorrow. He was feeling distress. He was feeling despair. The account of this in the book of Luke says that Jesus sweated as if great drops of blood. So that lets us know how distressed Jesus was with what he was fixing to have to do. And he didn't want to do this, but he knew he had to do it. And he knew that was God's will and he was determined to do God's will. And the idea here and the conviction behind these words is that God has the final say on everything and the future is in his hands. You know, we may all desire for something. It might be a, a business plan. It might be a financial plan. It might be personal plans. But whatever our plans are, Center them on God. Center your attitude on God. Put God first. God's plan and His will is bigger and better than anything we can plan. You know, as an eldership, we have always tried to tell you what our plans are for the future, to be transparent with you and let you know what our plan is and what we're thinking. You know we are without a pulpit minister at this time. And we are leaning and depending on Doug an awful lot. And uh, Doug, thank you for, for that and for helping us. Uh, I know y'all are tired of, of having elders up here. We're not polished, but we're trying to do the best we can. But we do have a plan for the future. And I just want to convey that to you, what our plan is. You know it's a hard time of year to be looking for a new preacher. Nobody wants to move at this time. But our plan is to not rush out and find a man to, to stand here in the pulpit and proclaim God's word. What we are looking for is a good, sound man, one who is dynamic, one who will preach the gospel, who will be true to the gospel, and be everything that, that we want him to be and everything that we need him to be. Now, we're not going to rush into this decision. We have several names that we are considering at this time. But in the meantime, our plan is to find an interim minister, someone who is sound, that can get us through this transition period. Uh, we've already talked to one man. We've got a couple others that we are considering and uh, we will probably try to talk to in the next few weeks. We're asking you as a congregation to bear with us during this time. We're asking you for your prayers. Pray for the right man, that we find the right man. Let me say this, Jerry, Aaron, and I are all appreciative of the prayers that you've offered up here in, in these last few weeks. 
we thank you so much. We thank you for your support. Uh, it was a great encouragement last Sunday evening when we had our, our get-together back in the fellowship hall that there were very few people that left after our service last night, but most everybody that was here went back there, and we had a great time of fellowship. Uh, things were upbeat. People laughed. People enjoyed being together. And that's what we want to keep doing. We want us as a family to enjoy being with each other, to have times of fellowship, to be supportive of each other, to love each other, to bear each other's burdens, to do all the things that we've been taught to do in the Bible. You know, the phrase, if the Lord wills, is the surrendering of our view of control. There's a freedom when we surrender to God's will. It always brings to my mind the old song, Come unto me, ye who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. There's comfort in those words. There's comfort in a lot of the songs that we sing. Uh, and I appreciate Richard. Richard always finds a way to, to find the songs that, that we want to convey about our feelings. As we sang right before I got up here to present the message, Many things about tomorrow I don't seem to understand. But I know who holds tomorrow, and I know who holds my hand. I don't know what tomorrow may bring. I may die. You may die. Christ might come back today. He might come back tomorrow. None of us know that. But we have to be ready. I don't know about tomorrow but I know that God does hold tomorrow. And I know that God does hold my hand. And I know that God is faithful to each one of us. And we need to be faithful to God and persevere through this time of transition. This is what we're trying to do. The past is gone. The only thing we can do with the past is learn from our mistakes. We need to work today holding on to God's hand. We need to look to the future again holding on to God's hand. What about your spiritual plans? Let me ask you to consider giving yourself over to God so that you can live and the freedom of knowing who holds tomorrow. Let me ask you to live in such a way that God is a focus for what you do. There is no better way to live than God's way. This morning, if you have a need, we have a baptistry here full of water. If you need to be baptized, if you know what the gospel says and you believe, and you confess, and you repent, you can be buried in the waters of, that, of baptism. If you've fallen away from the Lord, if you need prayers for strength, if there's any way we can help you, let me encourage you to come down front as we stand and as we sing. Let's reach out and give.